over 20 years working in communication strategies for development. Her interest in natural health treatments evolved from managing health projects and personal experiences. Is, is uh, Dr. Jensen here today? No? I'm sure, I have a feeling that she wants you to leave your phones at home. <laughs> Just a few. Okay, this week, Michael Holden, the American Legion of Honor in Mexico. Historian Michael Holden returns to present the American Legion of Honor in Mexico. This is a story of how in 1865, many Civil War veterans joined the Mexicans and managed to force Napoleon III's armies to withdraw and help restore the Republic in Mexico. Historian Michael Hogan, uh, oh sorry, Michael Hogan is an historian and the author of 27 books, some of which are here today, including The Irish Souls of Mexico, Abraham Lincoln and Mexico, Guns, Grit and Glory, and How the U.S. and Mexico Came Together to Defeat the Last Empire in the Americas. Hogan's book, The Irish Soldiers of Mexico, was the inspiration for two major documentaries and a feature film starring Tom Berenger. He is a former professor of international relations at the Autonomous University of Guadalajara and Emeritus Humanities Chair of the American School Foundation of Guadalajara. We are very privileged to give a warm, open circle welcome to Michael Holden. Sound. I'll tell a joke while you're working on the sound. Since you all kind of appreciate these kinds of jokes, <clears throat> one, of, one that my grandfather loved to tell was when the, when the residents of a small town on the border between County Kerry and Cork got together at the ends of a bridge that divided the two counties. Uh, they always argued about how the repairs of the bridge should go. <clears throat> And the people in Kerry said, well, we'll, we'll repair our part. And the people in Cork said, we'll repair our part. But this left about 20 meters in the, in the middle that no one ever repaired. And they began to have a great discussion about this. It went on and on and on. And finally, an old timer in the back of the hall said, I'm sick and tired of all this bickering going on here. Now we're only talking about 10 or 20 meters. Why well, I could piss halfway across it. And the chairman said, excuse me, sir, you're out of order. Well, of course I'm out of order. If I was in order, I could piss the whole way across it. <laughs> so, that's me this morning. I'm an emeritus professor. Emeritus means that, uh, that you're retired, essentially. <clears throat> um, but I always begin when, I, when I'm teaching my classes with a little with a little lesson, a little quote, and what's this going to be about today? And the kids always want to, what are you really going to talk about? And I don't know anything about that history. Just tell us what you're going to talk about for real. <clears throat> and what I'm going to talk about today is something that Eduardo Galeano, the Uruguayan uh, journalist, once, once wrote. He said, La historia nunca dice adios. Siempre dice hasta la vista. So today I'm going to take you back to the days of the American Civil War in the 1860s. Even though you might come from Canada, pay attention, it's still going to be interesting. <coughs> we tend to think of this episode, <coughs> and I should say before I get too carried away, we have the water. Um, I do have COPD, so every once in a while I'll lose my voice, but it'll come back. At least I have faith it will come back. Um, we tend to think of this episode in U.S. history has little to do with Mexico or Canada or Europe or the rest of the globe. But in fact, the American Civil War had an impact not only on the future of Mexico, <coughs> but on the entire American continent, as well as the balance of power in Europe and the aspirations of free people around the world. Abraham Lincoln once wrote, 
The whole family of Ban has a stake in the outcome of the U.S. Civil War. <coughs> and in no place was that clearer than in Mexico, a relatively new republic which had already lost half its territory in the War of Intervention in 1848, was in debt to European powers including Spain, France, and England, and had just emerged from a civil conflict called the Reform War that left it weakened and vulnerable. Now, as the U.S. was engaged in its civil war since the South attacked Fort Sumter in 1861, Napoleon III saw an opportunity. He would take advantage of Mexico's distressed state while the U.S. was busy with its own North versus South conflict. He hastily made plans <laughs> to set up an empire south of the border. As Napoleon's army invaded Mexico with naval and land forces in 1862, ostensibly to collect debts, <coughs> but really <coughs> with the intent to establish a new imperium in the Americas, the U.S. fighting desperately for its own survival <coughs> at first turned away. It could not afford to alienate the French, which at that time had the most powerful army in the world. To do so might put the U.S. at risk, since the French could join the Confederacy and overthrow the Union. So Mexico was on its own. Nevertheless, we all know what happens when one underestimates the Mexicans. <laughs> and true to form, they would have at least one surprise for the invaders. On May 5, 1862, Mexican forces under General Zaragoza, with the aid of a muddy field which hampered French artillery, severe dysentery which crippled the enemy infantry, won the first major battle in Puebla. It's celebrated today as Cinco de Mayo, mm. thanks primarily to the efforts of a cavalry captain by the name of Porfirio Diaz, who, when he became president many years later, ensured that the annals of history would devote ample space to this famous battle and his starring role in it. Mm. Thanks to his efforts at self-promotion, it's more widely recognized in the U.S. today than in, in, in most places abroad, more widely recognized than Mexican Independence Day. <clears throat> but what many do not know is that after this surprise military upset in Puebla, the French sent tens of thousands of reinforcements, not only from France, but taking a page from Putin's handbook, from Austria and Belgium, and even mercenaries from Egypt and Poland and Hungary. It was the largest invasion of foreign troops in the history of North America. They not only took back Puebla, but then they began to conquer the entire country, except for a small sliver of Sonora and Chihuahua in the north. The nation of Mexico was doomed to colossal defeat in the opinion of most international observers. Meanwhile, Maximilian, an Austro-Hungarian Archduke and friend of the Confederacy, accepted the crown of Emperor of Mexico, supported by an imperial army now numbering over 70,000 men. Napoleon and his fellow monarchs were convinced that the American experiment of a democratic republic would fail, and that a new era of European dominance would take its place. And nothing so far had dissuaded them. While Confederate forces approached the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C., Mexican Republicans were left to fend for themselves. The Mexican president, Benito Juarez, abandoned his capital in Mexico City, fleeing first to Puebla, then to San Luis Potosí, then to Monterrey, and finally, after several defeats, ended up with the scattered remnants of his army in the northernmost recesses of Chihuahua. It seemed like the end of the Mexican Republic. By 1864, the French army, combined with Austrian troops, had taken 90% of Mexican territory. Juarez and a small contingent had now fled to the border town of El Paso. With a few bedraggled soldiers, many barefoot, with antiquated rifles. The combined forces of the Imperial Army clearly outnumbered and outgunned the Mexicans. The situation was hopeless. How on earth could Juarez and his men survive, let alone overcome
around the superior imperial armies. We know eventually they did. But how? Most history books skim over this obvious conundrum. Some suggest it was the tenacity of warriors that made the difference, along with the professionalism of Porfirio Diaz. But the French had fine officers as well, and they had the superiority of veteran fighters. Others contend Napoleon grew tired of supporting Maximilian and simply began withdrawing troops. <clears throat> but why on earth would he withdraw troops if he was winning? and truly wanted to impose a French empire in the New World. It didn't make sense. And the more I read about this period over the past 30 years, the more skeptical I became of the facile answers. How could a guerrilla army of only a few thousand eloquent, eloquent men defeat the colossal military might of the most formidable army in existence at the time? Where would they find the money to buy arms and uniforms and boots and food and medicine? And even if they were able to buy some artillery, how could, he's up in the north in Chihuahua, how could he transport it south with all the ports blocked by the French, the overland route through Sonora and Chihuahua through the desert, very perilous? Why would Napoleon grow tired of supporting Maximilian after he had occupied the country and controlled 90% 90 of the territory? Moreover, he had the least the tacit support of the Confederacy which would certainly send troops to his aid in the future when the Civil War ended. Gradually, <clears throat> over the course of many years, I unraveled some facts which brought enlightenment to the situation. While the U.S. was neutral for fear of offending France and had them join with the Confederacy, several U.S. victories in 1863 began to make it clear the U.S. would win the North, would win the Civil War. Next, Lincoln's frequent meetings with an ambassador, unofficial, called Matias Romero, a 24-year-old uh, law school graduate, encouraged the government in exile to continue a guerrilla war against the French. Now, it's important to stop here and say a few words about this Romero character and how he and Lincoln are connected. He was, as I said, only 24 years old when Juarez sent him to Springfield, Illinois, Lincoln's home, to offer his congratulations on being elected president in 1861. <clears throat> now, he was the first foreign ambassador to ever greet Lincoln. And this was to prove important. Lincoln remembered this with fondness. They had dinner together. He played with Lincoln's yellow lab, Fido. And Lincoln questioned Romero about his country, about his finances, he expressed his admiration for the Mexican people. <clears throat> Finally, Lincoln gave Romero a letter saying that he supported Juarez in his government. And this was to be important because two years later, with Maximilian in power in Mexico City, Juarez holed up in Chihuahua with few resources. He was desperate. So he sent Matias Romero once more up north this time to Washington, D.C. See Lincoln, get help. Well, Lincoln was busy <laughs> with the Civil War. He was reluctant to do anything that would alienate the French. And he didn't have time to really speak to a erstwhile, unofficial Mexican ambassador. But the clever Romero would not be denied. Knowing that Lincoln hated to go shopping with his wife, Mary Todd, who was a notorious shopaholic, and also that there were no carriages available due to the demands of the war, Romero offered to accompany Mrs. Lincoln with his rented carriage. They went on several shopping excursions to downtown Washington. On one occasion, they spent four hours shopping for hats and dresses. <coughs> Needless to say, Lincoln was grateful. <laughs> and young Romero and middle-aged Mary became fast friends. She introduced Romero to important guests at the White House, including investors, wealthy landowners, and bankers from New York, San Francisco, and Philadelphia. Using his Lincoln letter for leverage, he persuaded them to invest in Mexico Liberty Bonds, 
worthless, right? But she had local, he had printed at a local print shop. <laughs> Completely valueless, unless Mexico defeated the French, which at this point was unlikely. He nevertheless was able to sell over $30 million worth of bearer bonds, wow. obtaining $18 million in hot cash, which he was able to funnel to Juarez. The funds financed the purchase of advanced artillery and repeating rifles, as well as supplies and medicine for the Juarez forces. Now the problem was getting the heavy artillery and munitions and other supplies to the forces in Mexico. The ports were blocked. The overland, overland route had already cost Juarez hundreds of dead pack mules and horses if they attempted to cross the Sonoran or Chihuahua deserts with such heavy loads. And this problem was solved, again, ironically, by an American. <clears throat> there was a Mexican general whose father had a ranch in Sonora, and he had purchased a number of camels from the U.S. Army back in the 1850s. General Carranza, father of a future president, knew of their ability to go many days without water and their resilience as pack animals. He offered them to water problem solved. These animals, as useful as they were, had been sold by the U.S. after the Civil War was declared. Why? Because the former commander in Texas who ordered them, Robert E. Lee, <laughs> who is now an enemy of the Union. The Americans' loss was Mexico's gain. The final problem confronting Juarez was a lack of trained men and generals. They had some guerrilla fighters in Chihuahua, Carranza had a few hundred in Sonora. The famous Zaragoza died shortly after the Battle of Puebla. But the redoubtable Porfirio Diaz was alive and well in Oaxaca with 800 men. And his subsequent victories would bring many more men to his side as the conservative forces deserted and came to join him. <clears throat> Still, even with all these additions, the number of trained men was small. But armed with American surplus weapons, including Springfield rifles, Colt revolvers, grooved cannons, their impact was formidable. Diaz defeated a French army twice the size of his own, not once, not twice, but three times. And after each battle, hundreds deserted from the Imperial forces and joined the Union. By 1865, with the signing of the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, General Ulysses S. Grant would free up over 50,000 troops to send to the Mexico border under the command of Philip Sheridan. In addition, many local organizations called the Monroe Doctrine Society had been organized to raise volunteers, weapons, and supplies to support the Mexican army. One group of recently discharged Union officers in San Francisco, now called the American Legion of Honor, was commissioned by President Juarez and played an active role in supporting the Mexican forces. They were all experienced in combat and brought with them their own repeating rifles and other weapons. Lincoln was assassinated that same year, 1865, but his successor, Andrew Johnson, sent a message to France that it was ready to come to the aid of Mexico to the full extent should it become necessary. Napoleon, a form of the victories of Diaz and others, began withdrawing troops. Desertions from the Mexican Imperial Army grew. And then another interesting thing happened. Phil Sheridan was one of the few Irish men at the time who was not prejudiced against black people. And he told his black soldiers, there were about 10,000 in his command, uh, they were called the uh, U.S. colored troop. He told them, you know, when this war ends, you can go back to Mississippi or Alabama, uh, but I don't think you're going to hit it off too well with the locals if you carry your weapons with you. <laughs> or you could do something else. You can keep your weapons and go down to Mexico. They can use some volunteers. So members of the U.S. colored troop accepted discharges at the end of the Civil War, and many of them went south to aid the Juaristas in the conflict. 
These were later the Buffalo Soldiers, who fought in the Indian Wars in the 1870s. Finally, the addition of veteran ex-Union officers helped turn some of the guerrilla bands into an organized army that would join up with other leaders in central Mexico and defeat the imperialists at Caletero, capture the emperor, retake Mexico City, and restore the Mexican Republic. There's only one academic paper on this subject, and no book. Robert Raul Miller's 1961 study of the American Legion of Honor delineates the role of the officers' corps, mentions in passing some of the fundraising activities, but he does not discuss the role of the colored troops at all, nor the large number of volunteers who join the Legion or worked alongside him, nor the advanced weapons, nor the funds that were raised by Romero, <laughs> nor the vast amount of cash from U.S. investors and ordinary citizens. It's interesting about these bonds, although they were assuming they would be valueless if Mexico lost, if Mexico won, they were all backed up by Mexican land, mines, and uh, franchises to build railroads. So they turned out to be very, very profitable for the investors. <clears throat> the money that Matias Romero uh, was able to raise not only bought repeating rifles and groomed cannons, but also bought surplus uniform <coughs> and boots for Juarez's troops, many of whom were barefoot. Now keep in mind, they bought uniforms. What kind of uniforms do you think they bought? Union uniforms. So many Union uniforms were in the field at Caretro that French observers wrote, over 20,000 Americans joined the fray. No wonder we lost. In fact, there were fewer, far fewer, probably less than 5,000. But the ones that did volunteer were trained four-year veterans of a bloody conflict in their own land and were men of proven courage. The defeat of the imperialists in Mexico was due to a coalition of communities, both Mexican and Me American and black, that overcame their mutual prejudices, resentments, conflictive histories to work together. Some were motivated by love of freedom, others by a quest for adventure or glory, and still others by business opportunities and profits. But regardless of their motivation, this time of Mexican-U.S. relations is one that should be taught in every classroom because it shows the positive results of mutual cooperation, how the struggles of two republics, Mexico and the U.S., shared a common factor, both nations seeking to overcome tyranny, both nations fighting for their survival, both nations coming together despite past differences to work for a common cause. Back to Eduardo Galeano again. La historia nunca dice adiós, siempre dice hasta la vista. And that brings me to the similarities of what occurred in Mexico and what's happening in the Ukraine today. Like Mexico, Ukraine has been invaded by a much larger and ostensibly superior army. Like Mexico, it has resisted courageously and inflicted defeats equivalent to Mexico's victory at Cinco de Mayo. Like France, however, Russia has responded by increased and more brutal pressure, including using artilleries against civilians, which the French also did. <coughs> As in Mexico history, there's a villain, Putin, and a hero, Zelensky, comparable to Napoleon and Porfirio Diaz. <coughs> Diaz and Zelensky are attractive to the public, highly visible, indefatigable self-promoters who put themselves at the forefront. Both the villains are connected to an empire, or a would-be empire, rather than a democratic republic, and yet both attacked a less powerful nation. Public outrage was on the side of the underdog in the 1860s, <coughs> as it is today. Everyone felt self-righteous in their condemnation of one over the other. Public opinion idealized Diaz, as it does Zelensky today. But nobody paid much attention then to the fact that increased supplies of sophisticated weapons 
prolong the war. It resulted in enormous deaths among civilians. It's estimated over 300,000 Mexicans died during this period. What nobody in the press commented on was how the munitions companies profited exorbitantly by these weapons purchases, how they discouraged the leaders of both sides from reaching a diplomatic solution. A diplomatic solution could have easily been reached in 1865. The war went on for another two years. And what happened when the smoke cleared? Yes, the French finally left Mexico with their tail between their legs. Yes, France would never again become a major power on the world stage. Yes, Napoleon III would be held in disgrace and condemned by all of Europe. Yes, Mexico became a republic and Diaz became president. But then, Diaz became president again. And then, Diaz became president again. And then, Diaz became president again. <laughs> a friend of the United States, a true friend of the United States, God bless him, became more and more powerful, more and more wealthy, and ultimately was a virtual dictator himself, mm. although no one in the U.S. would admit that. Thirty-three years after its victory over the French, Mexico will be torn apart by a new revolution, this time to remove Diaz from power. And that is the subject of one of my books on sale today, Guns, Good, and Glory. <clears throat> the other book, which I recently presented on December 19th to a small open circle group of about 40 back there in the cold, rainy Sunday, was that of the Women of the Irish Rising. And I have several copies left of that. And even more comparisons can be drawn there. Part of the reason Irish independence exists today, despite the brutality an overwhelming superiority of English forces, the destruction of all of central Dublin by British artillery, the murder of civilians. Part of the reason that conflict ended was the voices of Irish women, first in fierce resistance, but then in a negotiated peace to prevent the deaths of more civilians. Women did that. And we have much to learn from that struggle as well. History does not have any answers to today's problems, but it does suggest that when we find ourselves emotionally involved in thinking, this person or that is the villain, or this person or that is the hero, it is generally propaganda intended to deflect us from thinking about the real conflict at issue, in whose interest the war is being exploited and prolonged. The big question is why this story was not told before. And the reason for it not appearing in U.S. history was, of course, the U.S. wanted to remain neutral for a long time and not give France an excuse to join the Confederacy. Later, it was in the interest of Franco-American friendship and diplomacy not to reveal these secret plans made by Lincoln and the clandestine operations carried out by Sheridan. But also to kind of disguise how much land, how many mining concessions, how many railroad concessions, how many millions and millions of dollars the U.S. was able to, U.S. investors and U.S. businesses and corporations uh, were able to garner from their investment in the war. For Mexicans, the history of extensive interchanges as well as military and financial arrangements with the U.S. were not publicized because Juarez and administration wanted all Mexicans to see this as a national victory, a victory over France as a Mexican triumph, not one that shared glory with the U.S. And many of those motivations remain today. And that's why it was so hard to find this information. None of this was in the Mexican archives or the U.S. archives. Where I discovered it was in the Banco de Mexico archives. And how I found out they were there were from a fellow writer by the name of Catherine Mayo. And Catherine Mayo's husband was the director of the bank. So I edited one of her early books, and it was full of mistakes. And uh, as a matter of fact, she had already published it on Kindle, and I was reading the Kindle, and I was going, oh my God, you know, I can't even finish this book, there's so many mistakes. 
So I wrote and I said, take it off Kindle. Here's all, here's all the mistakes I've noted. Correct it and then put it back up. And she said, oh, thank you, Michael. If there's anything I can ever do for you, let me know. <laughs> well, at that time, I didn't know she was married to the president of the bank. But I found out later she was, and of course, there was something she could do. <laughs> anyway, the true history of the Ukraine, to bring us back to where we uh, were with <clears throat> history, never says goodbye. The true history of the Ukraine is being written as we speak. <clears throat> Oil companies are being given waivers to resume fracking. Shell deposits are being leased at great expense so America can become energy independent. Mm -hmm even though only 3% of our energy comes from Russia in the first place. Mm. What a foolish thing that is. Forgotten are the expenditures to drop alternative fuels and not be dependent on limited resources which pollute the environment. Thousands of artillery shells, millions of gallons of gasoline and jet fuel ramp up global warming each day, throwing away any minor adv advances we employ to reduce emissions over the last three years. Armament companies are seeing profits of 60 to 70 percent. Can you believe that? Mm. As they're selling off stockpiles of weapons and they're reduced and new replacements are called for. General Dynamics, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Honeywell, and General Dynamics stocks are at an all time high. And no senator or representative who has one of their plants in his or her district is interested in calling for a negotiated peace. And the same is true in the UK, unless you think you're exempted, with BAE and Rolls-Royce. And in Canada, with Bombardier in Montreal, Pratt and Whitney, and Bell in Halifax. And in France, with Airbus and Saffron. And in Germany, with Arma Waffen and Albrecht Bender. These armed companies are having sales of the centuries with profits of the billions. <coughs> Young people who are on the forefront of the global movement to reduce emissions, lower the carbon footprint, and protect the planet have fallen silent. Neutral nations like Mexico and India have been intimidated by the claim they're siding with enemy oligarchs. And no one is watching the money trail. No one is checking out the oligarchs in the West enriching themselves at the money trough. No one is asking the classic Latin question used throughout history, que vale? Who benefits? In whose interest is this continuous, continuing conflict? Many years ago, when the Congress was debating the financial reparations Germany should pay after World War I, and we was meeting some objections, oh, we're being too tough on Germany, he said, why the debate? After all, who won World War I? One wit responded, who won the San Francisco earthquake? <laughs> Both these books, Gun, Grit, and Glory, and Women of the Irish Rising, suggest we pause and reflect, not merely react. History is for the long game, and so are our children and our grandchildren who will inherit the planet we leave behind. Thank you for your attention today. I hope you'll join me later, and I'll sign a book for you. Thank you very much. Now, we have time for some questions. If the way this works is that if you have a question, raise your hand. I will, if you can yell it, okay, and uh, Michael's going to repeat it so the people at the back can hear it, so that's okay, yeah, okay. Did, did many of the black soldiers that came into Mexico to fight, did many of them stay or did they return to the United States? Some did, but it was more lucrative. Uh, actually, one, one of the major problems with the Legion of Honor is they didn't get paid. Mm -hmm. um, the simply didn't have any money. Um, and some of them had to pay their own way back. And one of the things General Sheridan did, he was keeping his eye on all of this, of course. And he really, he really did love his black, his, his black troops. <coughs> and when he found out that, that, uh, that many of them could not afford to get back to the U.S., he said, look, uh, come back, 
uh, enlist and I'll take you with me on my troops to the west. And that's how the Buffalo soldiers got started. Some did stay behind, however. Uh, but, but the majority of them left and uh, went back to the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Benito Juarez and Abraham Lincoln. I have your book, by the way, on, on Abraham Lincoln. If Lincoln didn't get assassinated, what do you think would have happened to Mexico? If Lincoln didn't get assassinated, what do I think would have happened to Mexico? Yes. Um, I think probably Lincoln would have ended the war in Mexico a lot sooner. I think he would have sent troops. He would have sent, you know, any veterans that wish to go, he would probably, you know, say, let's, let's continue your enlistment for another year and just go down and let's end this. Because Lincoln saw the war in Mexico as an extension of the Civil War. He, he thought they weren't very much different. Um, as a matter of fact, as it was apparent that the Confederacy was losing, many Confederate officers came to Mexico and tried to, you know, organize a slave colony in, you know, in Mexico. And, uh, you know, it didn't quite work out, but, but that was one of the plans. If, if it looked like they were losing, go to Mexico, reorganize, and when they got strong enough, then come back and fight the United States. And if France was still in power, that's, that's exactly what would have happened. And I think, I, I, I don't think Lincoln would have let the war drag on for another two years. Plus, he had seen so much suffering in his own country. I don't think he wanted to see, you know, one of the things Maximilian did to, 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 to he was frustrated, like, like Putin is frustrated right now. Maximilian was frustrated by these minor but still important victories that the, that the, that the Mexicans were, were, were accomplishing. And, and one of the things he did is he passed what's called the, 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 the Black Laws. Are you familiar with these? And, and they were anyone aiding or, or abetting a, a, a Mexican soldier uh, by giving him food, by letting him sleep in the house, uh, would, would be punishable by, 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 by death. And over 30,000 people uh, were killed just for doing that. So, you know, this was, you know, so when everyone, no, well, Maximilian was so liberal, they did a lot of nice things when he was, yeah. But he also killed, you know, out of hand, 30,000 people. Um, and he also had, had captured Juarez, and almost captured Juarez in Zacatecas. It was the American Legion of Honor that actually rescued Juarez. So that was important, too. Michael, we have a question here? Uh, I'm not sure if you are aware that a new energy bill or bill is being discussed in the Mexican Congress. Last week, John Kelly, congressman and businessman, came to talk to the Mexican uh, president. And they offered they would like to monitor the process of the implementation of the new law. What Americans will feel if Mexico would like to monitor what they want to implement in the immigration law. Mm. Mm. I know. <laughs> I know. There's a little bit of arrogance. Yeah. A little bit of arrogance there. Any more questions? More questions? No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you again, Michael. Thank you. Yes, thank you.